So I mean, like all the crazy workouts you see in like Jackie Chan movies yeah. and all the old kung fu. I didn't think those were a real thing until I got. <laughs> and so and I remember, like you know, I, I did all the basics, like all the you know step step kick, step step kick, and like all those Shaolin kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And so like whatever, I was just blowing through it. But there's like a couple little pointers, and like one of them was during the jump kicks, don't slam. You should come down quietly. Oh, yeah, you breathe, yeah, yeah. you don't make any sound. And so, like, I was roommate with Blair for a while, and, and he's very like that. I mean, like, the way everything enters is so quiet and still, which kind of goes with that whole uptight Japanese tea ceremony kind of yeah, yeah. focus and stuff. But it was kind of a really interesting experience, especially, like, considering you do see mostly the clink clang and, you know, seems to be how the Chinese like to get down but then there's like those super formal ceremonies where they do that where everything is like I mean even quiet (laughs) I mean it's just like I can see the like tapering of how they like enter things at angles and stuff and it's like I got a long way to go (laughs) yeah my team's not on that level at all Akira I gotta be honest man we gotta start recording Okay. Tales of Macaque Podcast, episode 15. Wow. <laughs> Sitting here drinking tea with my buddy, Akira. Like my buddy that I've not seen in many years. Many years. Many, many years. Yeah. Back when I was a lonely college student, just drinking tea and avoiding my homework. Yeah. I used to hang out at the Mad Monk Tea Shop, drink some tea. It's kind of what the tea shop served for a lot of people. <laughs> it's like, well, I know I got stuff to do, but... <sighs> it's not like a job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of... Well, I remember like several times I showed up there at like 3 p.m. and Taylor was like, oh, dude, Akira's coming with some tea. And we're like, fuck, yeah. And it's like such a unique opportunity at like 3 in the afternoon, three dudes stoked on this tea you just bought. Like it's such like, it's so hard. I tried to explain to my cousin so many times. Oh, I know. He's like, dude, I was like, dude, I went drinking last night, but it's okay. I went to the tea shop. I was there for like two hours. He's like, you had a tea shop for two fucking hours. <laughs> <laughs> what were you even doing there? Like, you can't picture it. <laughs> yeah. No, it's funny, because, like, I mean, a lot of people, I'm sure you go through this, too, where, like, they see you doing tea, and they're like, oh, that looks so cool, I want to do it. And you, like, kind of get them into it a little bit, or you go over it, and, you know, maybe they'll get enthusiastic enough, buy a set and everything, and then, like, a couple months later, so are you doing your, your tea ceremony every day still? Uh, Occasionally It's like Yeah I guess not everybody Wants to spend like An hour or two Every day drinking Yeah Yeah yeah. But they would like it They would But they're not going to I know That's why I don't tell anyone To buy a tea set I sell like Get as little Spend as little money as possible Yeah Get a bowl Put leaves in a bowl (laughs) If you have a mug That's fine You know (laughs) Get a thermos (laughs) Because if you're into it Like if you're into The whole tea set It'll come it it's going to happen. Like, no one could have talked you out of this. As it's kind of the way I look at it. As much as I have to say, there's, like, a whole lazy factor even, like, at that mm-hmm. level yeah. with people. To, like, it's, it's weird because they get so stoked about it in the moment. And mm-hmm. then, like, you check in and you're, like, kind of, like, excited thinking, like, oh, yeah, they must have gone home and, like, explored it. And now they have some stuff to talk about. No, yeah. no. Too many other things for the distracted mind to... Explore. Yeah, I think it's hard to give like adults a recommendation they're gonna follow. Like I, I, I see, I do so many things that like people would enjoy. Like I see so many movies, I'm like, oh, dude, you would really enjoy this. Never gonna see it, dude. Jujitsu, you would actually love it. Like I guarantee, I, not gonna try it. Yeah. <laughs> I think after a certain age, like people just stop taking recommendations. Like my dad's not gonna follow a recommendation you know, <laughs> on anything. <laughs> and this is something because I mean, like I've obviously grown up in America, but I've always felt like very foreign to the culture here and like it's never really foreign yeah it it probably goes (laughs) along with it too but i mean like i didn't really i guess grow up with the typical american middle america kind of culture and Mm -hmm. stuff and so like for me it's interesting to study american culture even though in Technically, I'm part of it, or whatever. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. like, studying okay, from the what inside. is this Middle America thing? It seems so weird to me. And the thing that I noticed they aim for, and this is kind of, I think, what makes American culture sometimes very mediocre, is they aim for comfort. Yes. Not for best or most awesome or anything like that. Comfort. Yes. Simple. So, like, I remember simple and comfortable, avoiding pain. Avoiding pain. Always avoiding pain. But. At the same time, immersing yourself in pain because nobody likes a predictable life. 
<laughs> but you know, then you get into it, and all right, well, maybe it's about you know just having this predictable thing, but then having to get over that the prediction is not really what you want, or right. you know, you don't want the foreseen future. You kind of want the surprise about it and stuff. But I remember I was talking to a friend a few years ago, and I was like. I don't know, I just, she's a really smart person and stuff, and so I was like, okay, so what is up with, like, the whole thing where sometimes you see girls will, like, oftentimes go for kind of the douchebaggy, typical mm. guys. The age-old question. The age-old question. <laughs> and, you know, it's like, obviously there's other people that are great candidates, potentially, instead of said kind of person right. or whatever, and her response, and, like, I gave her credit because, like, I knew that wasn't the place she would come from. And she kind of had to, like, think and sort of maybe empathize a little bit. But she said it really just comes down to being comfortable. Like, mm. You choose the douchebag because you know what you're getting. He's predictable. Yeah, there'll be fights, but you know they're coming and <laughs> stuff like that. And so I was like, wow, that's a really neurotic, like, way of going about life. But... That's the norm here. Yeah. Now, I've heard that explanation before, and it just made me think, like, does that mean that most girls' fathers are douchebags? Like, is that a, a more, is it just, like, the way it goes? You know. They expect it so because they've grown up with it? There's a know. park across the street from me here, and okay. the, a lot of times, you know, there's, like, lacrosse, and, like, people take their kid out to go do sports and stuff there. And so I was doing, you know, my my training session over there whatever doing forms but I could hear this like father daughter like combo like clear across on the other side of the little mini canyon that mm -hmm. I was in and just kind of picking up what I was hearing because there was an intense amount of like yelling and just this like emotional dramatic back and forth I was like what the fuck it's softball practice You're just <laughs> like, yeah <laughs> so as far as I could tell like you know, that was maybe, like, an important bonding thing the father-daughter, you know, combo did. And, like, she may have been good at some point, but she sounded like... This girl was playing softball? Playing softball, okay, like, some sort team. of league or something right. like that. But she was, like, apparently sucking recently in her game mm -hmm. because she had been sort of just doing other stuff. Unacceptable to many fathers. Yeah. <laughs> and so, like, it was interesting. Like, he was coming from a good place. They could tell where he was trying to help her accept that, that, like, you suck pretty much, mm -hmm. and you're essentially making the rest of your team have to make up for that on a certain level, and so, you know, pushing her to either really want to do better, or to, like, recognize that that's maybe not what you want to do anymore, and it's not fair to other people, but at the same time, it was this, such this, like, kind of hard-ass way about doing it, like, yeah. and he would tell her, like, it's you a hard know, conversation you, for anyone. And, and stuff, and it's like, but at the same time, it's just like, man... I'm sure there's a different way you could be, like, telling your daughter all that. But it kind of made me think that, like, that tendency to like bickering and fighting and, like, relationships and stuff might be, you know, oh, well, this feels familiar and mm -hmm. I know this is love because daddy or mommy or whatever kind of a thing. So then you go seeking that in your significant other, which mm -hmm. is kind of a weird e Oedipus comp... Or what is that? The Oedipus? Oedipus complex, yeah. yeah. And so it's like, wow. Just trying to recreate your family. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so it's kind of kind of a weird thing, I find, but... It's hey, just natural. You know, some yeah. people like street brawling, and some people like doing something a little more constructive, so... <laughs> hey, hey. Yeah, I, I saw that my friend, my buddy who lives up in Oregon, he screams with his girlfriend multiple times a day. And, like, I didn't... I was so baffled when I got there. But then when I finally got out of the situation, I stayed with them for, like, a month. And I finally got back home and I talked to one of our common friends, like, did he, like, yell at his parents all the time? He's like, all the time. Like, did his parents yell? Oh, constantly. Did he yell at his brothers? Yeah. I was like, okay. Because, yeah, like, sense. I can't handle any of that. Like, there was no yelling in my house. Yeah. There was conflict, but we all, like, we uh, solved it by, like, avoiding each other. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it was kind of, it was like uh, a big enough house where we could all avoid each other. Go like, just her. that size where you could, like, yeah. add a door and, like... <laughs> And so that's my problem. Uh, that's my, like, uh, solution to things. So, like, having a girl yell at me is, like, a non... That's not going to fly. <laughs> like, I'm not going to be with a girl who, like, oh, like is negative, like, is yelling. Like, that's... I'm not, I can't handle that. But my friend loves it. He revels in it. Something. Like, something is normal about it to him. 
Whereas opposed to here, we are sitting here drinking tea. This is normal as fuck to us. We've done this many times, my friend. But to a lot of people, this would be like very confusing. Like, wait, you just pour that water in three different things. One of them has plants in it. What the fuck, man? They're all made. I have to drink this. Different stuff. And, <laughs> yeah, it's that crazy foreign Asian stuff. Ah, oh, can't trust those Asians. But yeah, <laughs> there you go, sir. Thank you, my friend. Yum cha. Mm. Wow. Yeah, it's interesting. It reminds me of kind of like the Key Moon black tea, but with like. A little bit more wildness to it or something like that like a shung puar kind of gets sometimes but yeah some sort of delicious some sort of delicious <laughs> some yeah sort of I guess good chinese red tea there's never really any good term for all these things it's <laughs> yeah. funny like i'll sometimes just for fun like i'll see what people say about the same tea and it's like yeah. whoa which never mind you yeah know? <laughs> that's why i never bothered I never, well, because I also didn't, like, I feel a lot of people come to tea from, like, like for example, our, our good friend Taylor, he came from wine. Yeah. Where in wine, you're like, mm, I taste leather boot. And yeah. That's, like, a cool thing to say. Like, I never had any of that. So I, every time someone tells me what it tastes like, I'm like, okay. Like. I believe you. <laughs> I can get into it, but those weird, like, I don't know what they call it, poetic termings, like mm-hmm. leather boot. And There's stuff. an art to it, for sure. Yeah. People are better at it than others. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Which I guess anytime there's like a skill differential, like people are going to get stoked on it. Yeah. It well, I wonder like... sometimes, too, how much it is, is like, you know, the people are trying to sell certain points, and so you tend to pay attention to those notes. Oh, right. So, like, it was interesting. It's a good salesman to... tactic. It is. Yeah. And, uh... I... I found this actually with cannabis. I used to work in a collective years ago. And there was this kind of younger guy or whatever that would come in, hippie kind of dude or whatever. Go figure. But uh, <laughs> he was he was kind of interesting. You could tell he was sort of an intellectual type, even though he was very much obviously a hippie. But anyways. And so, like, whenever he would come in, because most people are like, okay, what do you got? What's good? Tell me what I want to get. Mm-hmm. And they're like, well, okay so easy to sell them essentially what is easy to sell at that yeah, point yeah, it's yeah. like oh, this one gets you high yeah. oh perfect <laughs> dude i came in here i wasn't high now i can get yeah, home I can get god high. yeah <laughs> i mean yeah i mean we got pretty good with like variances and stuff obviously and recommendations but there was this one this kid who used to come in that i i kind of respected he'd say don't don't tell me anything i want to look around first and you know I'll ask you questions if I have them, but mm. let, let, let me do it. And I was like, ah, oh, there's somebody. This guy knows something. Yeah. <laughs> he knows something. <laughs> you know, truly open to the experience versus tell me what it's supposed to be yeah. kind of a thing, you know. Dude, I have this dilemma because I see a lot of movies without knowing anything about them. I go off, like, I have a couple, like, factors I pick movies from. One's, like, a director of a movie I really like. You know what I mean? If someone's made my favorite movie and then they have a new one, I'll just go see it. Yeah. Like Woody Allen has a new movie. I have seen the trailer, but even if I hadn't, I'd be there. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so I pick, there's a theater in Irvine, close to where I live, and they always show awesome independent movies. If there's a movie there rated above seven on IMDb, I'm there. But so hard telling someone about that. Yeah. Like, dude, I think it's a Miles Davis movie. I don't know. It's like... <laughs> <laughs> I saw a documentary about Yo-Yo Ma and his band, the Silk Road Ensemble. Oh, wow. One of the yeah, coolest, yeah. like, music things. I had no idea. I never, I, I wasn't sure what Yo-Yo Ma did before I saw this movie. I just knew he was, like, a famous dude. And then, you know, I love him. I love his music. I love yeah. his band. And just things like that. It's so hard to, like, people really want to know, like, is it good? What is it? Comfort. It, very comfortable, <laughs> man. You don't want to go in there and be like, what the fuck? The documentary? Yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, there's that other thing, too. Like, you know, learning challenges you. Where it, and that's not always necessarily comfortable for mm-hmm. people. And I notice, you know, people that like documentaries are people that are kind of a little bit more alive in, in that sense where, yeah, they want to find out more about life, not just sort of be given a reiteration on a screen, essentially. Mm-hmm. And, you know, a lot of it's I don't know, kind of niche and sort of mindless these days mm-hmm. I find like I, I watch thing or I don't know I don't really watch TV but my roommate does and I, I overhear it all the time I'm just like the fuck is this <laughs> house hunting in the Caribbean like <laughs> why like that doesn't make any sense and then 
somebody in the real estate agency paid a lot of money to get that on there to boost their whatever yeah know, sales and no, what and i found man is like because I, I spent two years in asia right two solid years yeah like not watching any tv like being very outside of what's going on but then i come back home and my mom watches tv all the time oh. and i can't tell when she's watching a satire or a serious show like those series like she watches law and order and spinoffs yeah but she also watches like uh, like the daily show and like things like that along that similar line of humor and the the line is so blurry, man. Like it's so crazy. Like political shows nowadays, there's no way to tell. No. Because there's really clever satire. Like there's some legitimately funny stuff out there, and it's like, <laughs> like our political race right now could be a satire, and it'd be like really clever. Like how the fuck do they think of anything that crazy? That is so. Like, <laughs> it is kind of amazing in a way. When I think right. About like if it. someone crafted this, it'd be more impressive than. Like, <laughs> You know, honestly, like, I just kind of sit back and watch the freak show for most of it. But a lot of people, unless it's in the frame of the TV or something, mm-hmm. they, they don't really know that it's a show yeah. going on. And I remember, like, that was George Carlin's thing. He's like, I don't vote anymore. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't matter anyways. I opt out. I've just kind of given in at this point. I'm just here to watch the show. I hold no go. bars. There you <laughs> go. It's the only way to like not get pissed off, man. Like, dude, the the be- uh, the best example that I have of like how um, like heated politics gets people is that after jujitsu, it was like there's like 30 guys in the room, all sweaty. We just gone to war. Everyone's kind of out of it, but like jovial and like in a good mood and like friendly. And so these two guys were talking about where they like to eat. Most simple of conversations, just like, oh, dude, you live in that place? You go here? Oh, nice, dude, I go there too. And they're talking about it. It's some sort of like deli or like maybe even a grocery store where they have pre cooked food. And they're like, dude, Monday the bacon's fucking good. Tuesday, it's like Monday's bacon, it's a little burnt. And someone <laughs> made a clever joke. He's like, oh, they got that Bernie Sanders on Tuesday. Yeah, I go there on Monday, get the Donald Trump. No joke that makes any sense, yeah. but I use the names. Yeah. All of a sudden, five guys turn around and go, Fuck Trump. <laughs> oh my God, I know. And then it's like, yo, but Hillary's bad too. And everyone's got like their, you know, just Sides catchphrases and like, it, politics yeah. is bullshit. It's like, yo, this is a bacon conversation. <laughs> I hear you, yeah. It it's gets almost so like heated. people are looking to be offended about something. Yeah. But you know, like honestly, and you probably experience this, and that might be even what is your experience, is that, you know, if you do study conflict resolution in some form whether it's you know in the context of martial arts or maybe you do psychology or something like that or whatever you know you you're good on conflict you don't Mm. need to go start beef because you get your fill and it's constructive it's not this thing where i'm gonna randomly shoot out like you know when people first get into sparring matches they're just kind of throwing stuff out there they're not very methodical it's like the button masher you know Mm -hmm. when you play street fighter and stuff and a fun way to play a fun way to play (laughs) yeah until you're like well so you know some (laughs) comments and you just get bored of just you're not really doing anything you're just mindlessly flailing around kind of a thing and so, like, you know, I find a lot of people, they're, they're looking to fight, but they don't even necessarily have good angles or maybe you could say stances or any mm. sort of, you know, uh, strategy or anything. It's just mindless flailing yeah. around. It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I met a bunch of guys who got into jiu-jitsu because they were fighting, and they're like, yo, I got to learn how to do this, and I'm going to keep fighting. They get in there, they start training, they love it, they make friends, they keep coming back. All of a sudden, they have no desire to fight. They get it all out, and they're like, yo, this shit's dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> like, there's a 115-pound girl who could strangle me right here. Like, I'm not... <laughs> it's no joke. Like, man, and, and like, I, there are just levels, too, where you you get so humbled. Because, like, you know, I think the girl thing is, is probably a little played out at this point. I'm trying <laughs> to show the technique of things. Because girls these days are just as, like beefy and you know into mm-hmm. the same kind of power methods as males are i think that's pretty across the board now but like when you go play in a class full of senior citizens and you get your ass handed by every one of them you just are like oh shit 20 years of martial arts didn't mean anything so when you're playing with senior citizens what does that look like so standing you, in front of each other usually it's it's push hands okay. you know and Really, if you can learn push hands in depth, 
you don't really need to do full like you get a pretty good idea of who's going to beat the shit out of one another if it really came to it just so in push hands is, is it no contact then oh it's totally contact um i mean you're touching the idea is that it's very much like rolling you know rolling mm. you got to learn to relax mm -hmm. and until you do that you're just going to get tossed around pretty right. much and so somebody that spent like 20 years learning to relax in, in whatever situation is just gonna know all those little subtleties where it's just like no nah, yeah I flipped you off already kind of mm. thing so there's one woman in particular that <laughs> sticks out still and it's just like wow she is she's amazing and she wasn't even the best in the class mind you she was one of the more advanced ones in my uh, Tai Chi push hand teacher uh, Chris Luth's uh, core group that he's had for I think he said like the minimum amount of years training with him in there was 12 all the way up to like 30 so yeah you know, pretty good dedicated yeah group of people that are focused and really into it kind of a thing and so this woman Anne oh man so like you know we we do the thing where you know you partner up with people and then after a certain period of time the teacher says okay and one line switches and so you know you get to rotate that way through Right. each side essentially so I got to Anne and I had never played with her before or whatever she was kind of just taller than me you know definitely like 60s maybe 70 years or something like that um, full head of white hair you know all that jazz so okay and so you know like kind of like you know when you touch hands in jiu-jitsu when you're standing there's that kind of feeling out game usually you go through and you're kind of feeling for that point to just, just pop the leverage off on right. them and so a lot of times, you know, if it's between more equal players and push hands, that is kind of what happens. You're doing this sort of feeling out. It's a little bit softer, I think, on average, but it's kind of the same principle. But the moment I would touch hands with this woman, so it's like, you know, you go here and, you know, you, the moment you like do that just kind of a thing. Just touch just, your hand or a wrist. Just, yeah, you know, not even like pushing it. She's already pushed me off balance. Uh. And oh shit, okay, it was like a second even. So in what way is she pushing you off balance? She's like adjusting your arm? Like it feels like, you know, you'll you'll come and meet and you'll touch hands kind of a thing, like maybe mm -hmm. the wrist or something. But it you know, instead of needing to pull your arms or something like that to get into moving your spine and your mm -hmm. center and stuff, her sensitivity was such that, you know, if you know the method you can control the spine from the arms right. and stuff like that. And so her awareness her sensitivity her responsiveness was just that that the moment i touched hands with her she already knew the point like mm. I, it was that obvious to her or i was giving it away that obviously or something like that so she continues to do this for like six seven times in a row i get popped off okay go to touch hands with her and then popped off again and okay and go to touch hands with her again and popped off again and throwing a couple feet one way and she's like smiling, just totally having fun with it. I was <laughs> like, oh, yeah, don't get upset about this. It's just not worth it. <laughs> and then after, you know, a few rounds of having her fun, she starts, you know, actually kind of giving me some pointers and sort of dialoguing with me about it and stuff. And so every time you, I'd play with her, just same kind of thing. Just there's no contest. Mm. Like, I could not win against the senior citizen. <laughs> and so, like, one day we were, we were partnered up in class and, like, she was explaining something about, like, the spinal alignment and stuff to be able to especially do, like, you know, kind of the centrifugal, centripetal uh, movements to just sort of redirect all the force that you give her and stuff. And she was like, Oh, you know, I can't quite do everything I want to in, in push hands and Tai Chi because I actually have three fused vertebrae oh in my, my spine God. from like an injury years ago. Like, you know, <laughs> I, I, I guess I still do okay. I'm like, Fuck, this is a <laughs> handicap senior citizen has been whooping my ass. Oh, man. So, Tumbling. <laughs> yeah. Which is maybe one of the best parts of it, man. The, the book that I've been reading, I'm trying to read it really slowly. I don't want to go through it too fast. It's a new book called Ego is the Enemy. Oh, it's yeah. a great book. It's tremendous. <laughs> By Ryan Holiday, I believe is his name. And so that, that's just the whole point is like, imagine if you went in there like, yo, I'm the shit. I'm going to teach this old woman. 
Imagine if you even called her, not even just a woman. You're like, I'm going to teach this bitch. You walk in there, just like, or like you called a girl, like, yo, I'm going to Tai Chi, you should come watch. <laughs> yeah, and then she ends up showing me a thing or two, bro. Which happens, man. It breaks people. Like, some people can't handle that. Well, you know, it's it's the good reminder, I think. And when people don't want the reminder, that's when there's that issue and conflict. Mm-hmm. Like, but it's interesting that you bring up that title of the book. I, I mean, obviously, there's like a bunch of crazy stuff going on in the news all the time yeah. recently and stuff. And like everybody wants to fight all these different solution or, you know, problems from these different angles, whether it's the political race or, you know, gay shootings or whatever yeah. or black lives it's a lot matter. to be upset about yeah a lot to, to be upset about if you'd like to be. yeah but then you know greed corporate corruption and all that really the only thing that's underlying all of it is ego self-centered mm. behavior that I need to think about getting more for me than this other person or right. I need something more badly than someone else without actually checking in about that kind of a thing so like i I follow and I actually uh, dialogue a bit with this, uh, well, he's a physical science major that does a lot in uh, cognitive and uh, neuroscience research cool. at Penn State and John Hopkins. He was really involved with a lot of the meditation research and even kind of where the overlap of um, psychedelic science comes into play with that. So really cool dude, very, very well developed kind of a fellow and stuff. But, you know, his thing he says is like, you know, I mean, you don't even have to like kill the ego entirely but just like reduce it by like 20 percent on a global level and like Mm. most of your problems will melt like overnight practically if not within a week because just the motivations to do all the same things that lead us into all these issues just oh why do i want to do that (laughs) (laughs) that's the argument for why like uh presidential candidates are getting worse (sighs) like sam harris explained it the best where he's, he's on rogan's podcast and he's talking about like like, we would think that each president would be better than the last. Each one would come up more enlightened, more knowledgeable, like, more qualified, right? Like, if it was a good position in a perfect society, the next guy would be better than the last every single time. Yeah. But I think because of this ego thing, <laughs> the people who, like, like, the most qualified person in the world wants nothing to do with being president. <sighs> There yeah, is yeah. someone who would be perfect. Yeah. I don't know who it is. It's not <laughs> me. <laughs> they don't want to do it. It's not it. me. But yeah, it'd be someone we haven't heard of, right? Isn't that yeah. kind of the main thing? Like, that's kind of the mentality? Well, yeah, they say... Well, like, the, the, there's the, the best other... martial, martial artist in the world is probably not someone we know. Yeah. And, that and kind of mentality. I know that comes up a lot with the, like, traditional martial arts and MMA or how that would work in MMA and yeah. stuff. And, like, I mean, I... I some <laughs> there are involved. some people that could just whoop some ass in there, and they, I mean, but they won't have the image that is commercially uh, what a lot of sports fighting is aimed mm. at. But they would whoop ass if they really had the ambition to compete. But that's a tricky thing, huh? Yeah, and you know, I I get it after a certain point too. It's like you know, there's a certain limitation point where you're like, yeah, I could probably fuck some shit up but i don't know if i really want the consequences and the responsibility that comes with doing that really you know i mean i love weapon arts and stuff i love blades and swords but you know as tempting as it would be to cut a carcass or two yeah (laughs) (laughs) so i play it other ways like jesus christ (laughs) i remember like one of them and i used to work at um sprouts or whatever and uh have to like stock the registers and the registers get busy as fuck you know just mm-hmm. people lining up and stuff and but you know i still got to go from each register and it's like back and forth constantly to fill all the little uh, temptation uh racks things that they little got candy. there to try and get you at the the checkout always get me always yeah. i'm so so susceptible <sighs> <laughs> you know, that's psychology. It's candy man. and it's cheap? Oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> Don't you need this? You know you need it. Ah, dude, so man. I was stalking all those uh, temptations. <laughs> and it occurred to me at a certain point, oh, well, you know, there's this whole thing in like trying to make sure you're being realistic about your cuts and stuff. Like, am I following through? And, you know, it's not just like a bat. You smack something. You actually have to... Now, if you've ever seen somebody like a sushi chef mm-hmm. cut, you know, it's a very um, particular and very focused cut. And, you know, it, it follows the length of the blade. It doesn't smash the blade on somebody. Like, you know, I think we 
Game of Thrones would probably get into with that mm -hmm. style of fighting, where it's bash, bash, bash kind yeah. of a thing. The simplest form. Simplest form, yeah. yeah. The most logical. <laughs> well, it actually, it can get really advanced. I, I used to train with the uh, Society of Creative Anachronisms. They do all the full armor training and stuff like the knights used to do back in the day where they'd make practice weapons but mm -hmm. I mean full contact sh sword shield or whatever your weapon of choice helmets full armor chainmail that whole thing what you see at Ren fairs and stuff and there is a real technique to it I mean it's it's so subtle and stuff and it's not you know a meathead mm -hmm. bashing like you got a club kind of a thing like, there is a really intelligent mechanics to a lot of you know even just the simple sword and shield so I think, though, on TV, it's less exciting to depict that. So. Yeah. No, people want Brock Lesnar smashing. Yeah. That's what happened last yeah. night. Uh, I was watching, last night was the biggest UFC, probably ever, was last night. And I was at a big the gym Lesnar watching fight. it. Yeah. Yeah, dude, people are so heated about the Lesnar fight. But right before that, oh, no, sorry, two fights before were two of the best featherweights in the world. It was a super technical battle. Like, it was really dangerous at any point. Either one could have done something. And it was very, like, it was Jose Aldo and Frankie Edgar. It was an amazing fight. Didn't get much of a reaction from the crowd. Brock yeah. Lesnar goes in there, and he fights like a caveman. Yeah. He's good at wrestling. <laughs> like, you can't take it away from him. He's a college wrestler. But he doesn't know much else. Yeah. He doesn't know much about jiu-jitsu. knows nothing about tai chi. Yeah. His training is you cut down a tree and run with it. Pick yeah. it up and run. Strongman competition kind of a thing. Yeah, yeah he would uh, fit in very build. well there. Like, yeah. uh, he's not done it, but he could. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he would fit in. And it's just funny, like, how much more um, of a reaction that gets out of people. Yeah. Like, Jose Aldo shutting down Frank Yeager's takedowns. An incredibly hard thing to do. Frank Yeager's a world-class wrestler. Yeah. Jose Aldo shucked him off. Just played with just him. Played Get with the him. fuck off me. He's doing that. Like, an incredibly hard thing to do. Yeah, it's not that Spider cool. Spider in the fly. Yeah, you know, I, I do notice, and that's kind of where I, I sometimes, I, I enjoy actively participating in, you know, maybe an MMA setting or something like that, but I don't always necessarily like the spectator aspect of it, and maybe it's just I've never really been into sports or that. You should try jiu-jitsu, no one wants to watch. Yeah, <laughs> I like those kind of things, but you know, like, I will admit, a lot of people, they just don't get real technical or real detailed battles. There's yeah. such little things that you couldn't know if you've only seen it from the outside you haven't been in you know that position where mm -hmm. it's like all those little subtle awarenesses that go in with shifting a little bit mm -hmm. this way up micro shift that way you know they say like the skilled match between swordsmen is like this like standoff pretty much or mm -hmm. like the cowboy gunslingers where they're just standing there for most of the time but they're watching Doesn't all those like little yeah. micro movements and it's like uh, uh. Huh? Eh, no. Oh, shit. Okay. And they're having the battle pretty much from there, but to the average person. So I just get it on, you know, brawl or whatever. Happens every time uh, Floyd Mayweather fights. One of the best boxers <laughs> of all time, right? He's like, take a punch, you pussy. Like, what kind of terrible advice yeah. is that? Like, take a punch? Like, put your hands down? Like, what do you mean? Yeah. The dude's undefeated. Like, yeah, he didn't even get hit. Like, yeah, that's amazing. The other guy's really good at hitting people. <laughs> yeah. He's fighting a skilled guy. Well, I think there's definitely a certain, like, crowd of spectators that are really looking for the original, like, Roman, you know, uh, bare-knuckle boxing and stuff mm. like that. The blood sport, you know, where they just lift these two guys up on platforms. They had nowhere to go. And they just had, wrap, like, leather wraps, usually, and were slaves of some sort. Mm -hmm. And they just had to go, just beat the shit out of each other until one went down. Otherwise, neither of them would get let down. And then, of course, you know, the winner gets prized and the other one gets thrown out of lions or something like that afterwards. But he gets fucked up. There's no dodging in that. <laughs> it's not meant to be that way. It's like, no, we're there to see people fuck each other up. I mean, we got the lions next. So, you know, you guys are just a warm up match pretty much. And, you know, there's that, I guess that demand within a certain mm. amount of the uh, you know which i love too man i get it i love those fights every once in a while <laughs> it's not it's not the best case scenario but when it happens yeah. is a dude diego sanchez just fought like for like the 30th time last night he's this old dude every fight is like that it's really? amazing he's not the most popular guy in america every single fight he comes out the most intense when he walks out he raises his hand in the air and goes yes 
Yes! Like, he's the most <laughs> intense guy in the world. He's wow. so great. And he yeah. came out there. He's old, man. And he, he got fucked up in the first round. But he didn't go down. He would ne- he'll never go down. He's just bloody, hands up, biting on his mouthpiece, running forward. And I feel for him. Like, it's like that's... That's his most natural expression. Yeah. It's him in his purest form. Like, it's what he wants to do the most in the world. And he's done it many times. Yeah. Just he's never been champion. He's not going to be champion. <laughs> he's not. Apparently, that's I, not I, his I concern. Wouldn't, I wouldn't take a class from him. I don't want him as my coach. Yeah. But he's sick. He's a great fighter. Yeah. But it's just weird. Like, he's not the most popular guy in America. <laughs> Well, yeah. I don't know. Like, it's not always logical. Who's that? Um, McGregor. Conor like, McGregor. Yeah. Best shit talker like, in the world. On, but honestly, too, like, it was kind of cool when he did lose. And he's like, you know what? Yeah, fuck it. I lost. I'm not. He like, had a great attitude. I'm a human. Like, yeah. period. Like, get the fuck over it. You shouldn't have been expecting that to begin with. Like, that's just not realistic. And I want to see you get in here and make a difference. Yeah. That is the case. Yeah. Pussy ass <laughs> McGregor got choked out by. Yeah, a black belt, like one of the best jiu-jitsu guys. Now I will say, wait, he got punched by a great boxer. There are some that <laughs> still like kind of disappoint me with the loss, and it's not that they always take it bad. It's just like, ah, oh, really? Is that still where the game is at? Okay, well, give it another ten years, kind of thing. But like when Silva lost, I was like, the first time, not the, the second knocked, time, was kind of just out by Chris oh. Weidman. And but when I heard the reasoning for it, is that he was expecting. A, pre- a predictable combo to come yes. up, and the last move wasn't the predicted combo, yes. and so he lost. And it's like it was that that easy? Because in MMA <laughs> striking, it's all left, right, left, yeah. right, left, right, and so the combo that got him, Chris Weidman threw a left, missed, threw a right, missed, and threw a right back fist. Not a good move, not like a strong move, yeah, but just enough to fuck up his timing. Yeah, yeah. You know that's all it takes, really, for most. If and it surprises me, there's not more sensitivity training to deal with that to where you shouldn't have to think in pre pre conceptual kind of fighting and, and mm-hmm. so on it should just be whatever flies at you is what you got to relate to right then and make the best of it kind of yeah. a thing but you know like it was fascinating because like obviously aikido's kind of got some similarities to some of the the soft style arts like you know judo is actually a soft style or jujitsu it means the soft gentle technique mm-hmm. essentially and so like, all right. It's supposed to be gentle. I got a heel hook today. Uh, yeah, <laughs> no. Oh, and not that it's, it's not hurtful. It's gentle for the other person executing it to you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's more gentle than getting shin kicked. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, even like, I, I remember seeing some of the like old videos of like the, I think it was like one of the last tenth dons or something for when the jiu jitsu traditions, but like, I mean, all his like, Eighth, ninth dawn, you know, holders and stuff that seemed like they were probably his dedicated students. I mean, they're all big and, yeah. you know, definitely kind of ripped and stuff. These Japanese guys? Yeah. And this is just a bald, skinny old man. Mm-hmm. In a key. And they're going to try and throw him every time, but he's just so relaxed that they, they don't have any tension to throw him with because mm-hmm. you need a spring in somebody. And that's why you do joint locks is to create that condition to... Right tighten up and pop him off and leverage him but no he just like like they try to take him you know take an arm over their shoulder from the from the back and you know flip him over mm-hmm. and he just like piggyback on him for that moment kind of a thing just like hang on I'm like hey whatever and that'd go on for like a few rounds and then all of a sudden he'd come down like it looked like you know he got pulled up because he was the guy was trying to execute a throw or something on him and then he went down, and on that that time, then he just drops and flips the other guy. Because nothing. Like, dude, just relax the whole time. Yeah, that's a weird thing in fighting, man. Sometimes just like going limp is like, like that's all you could. What? Like Drunk I've had a, I've had a couple like um, black belt instructors do that. Like when we're training, yeah. they'll just go limp, and it's the most like demoralizing thing. Because I'm not trained for that. I'm used yeah. to like those reactions, like you said. Like I'll grab the neck, not trying to finish it because he gives up the arm. And then one time my coach in Taiwan gave me his back, the worst thing to do, right? Like in theory. And then raised his chin, exposing his neck, and then just laid there while I couldn't choke him. 
It's like, like it's, all right, I've learned nothing. <laughs> structure makes so much difference, especially when you get to those higher levels yeah. and stuff. I this mean, this guy's a black belt. I can't even touch that. If it fell on the floor, my hands would burn if I t- picked it up. This guy's a black belt. Yeah. He's been doing this a thousand years. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's that difference in sensitivity too. Like you know, as soon as you put your hands on him, he's reading you better than you probably read read what you're doing in the situation kind of a thing just everything I'm doing he taught me yeah as well. that too yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like you're, gonna be doing other you're gonna wanna you know we got the odds against you but yeah, you know. <laughs> but yeah you know the the thing with with a lot of the I think the the truly because I mean even when like Silva was at the top of his reign and Machida and all that people were getting bored with those matches they, they didn't like it and you know, like, I, I remember watching... Yeah, really t- dumb people. And they didn't really get that much extra training. I mean, it was just really, to me, very basic stuff when mm-hmm. I saw Seagal, Steven Seagal, doing the, the training with them and stuff. And, like, there's the one video with, where he's showing Machida how to kick. And it was like, wait, really? Machida doesn't know how to kick like right. that already? Like he's throwing kicks and And he really, too, like, like, he was, like, sincerely kind of like, wow, yeah, this is fucking a game changer, you know? Because, like... The, the kind of standard MMA kick is either the Muay Thai kind of kicks, which round don't... Houses. It's roundhouses yeah. mostly. There's not too many front front kicks with that that work. Until least. Anderson Silva did it once. Yeah, uh, once. does it. Once. <laughs> Teep to the face. <laughs> but... I got popular. You know, like... Oh, what was I going to say? Oh, I forgot what I was going to say. Steven Seagal showed Steven, him Oh, yeah, kick. yeah. So he was showing him just, you know, just fucking spear that thing. Just... Mm. Spear straight through, no hesitation. Don't lift your knee first and then push out like right, that, right. you know, just straight to what you're shooting and then bring it back kind of thing. And, you know, like, Machida was like, he had those couple, where it's the good kind of puzzled, where it's like, you're confused, but it's that on the verge of, holy shit, I feel something. I don't know what it is mm-hmm. yet, but it feels useful, you know. Yeah. And, and then by the end of the video, he, he'd kind of gotten it, sort of a thing that's like, Really? <laughs> These are the top fighters uh, at the time, kind of a That's thing. That's props to Machida, too, man, because his dad's a karate master. He taught him when he was two. He's yeah. been throwing kicks for 37 years. I don't know how old he is. <laughs> yeah, right. He's <laughs> been kicking 30, 30, 33 is a more realistic number. Yeah. He's been kicking, and he was UFC champion, and then Steven Seagal taught him a kick. <laughs> That's, yeah, that was kind of where. But, you know, I realized, though, that those are all the hard methods and stuff, and he's just saying, no. Closest way to get, or fastest way to get to a point is a straight line. So, you know, none of these winding up kicks, just bam, go straight through it, keep going through them. And it's like, oh, wow. Yeah. I, I heard he had trained Silva too for a little while yeah. or whatever. But. but no one can figure out if it was true. Because, yeah. like, Steven Seagal is this kind of silly guy in the MMA community. Yeah. I get, I, apparently, he's great at Aikido. I don't really know. Uh, who am I to say? I've seen But, like, Anderson Silva is such a goofy dude that, like, when he talks great about Steven Seagal, people are like, is that... Is it for real? <laughs> like, he's not, Anderson Silva's not really like a trustworthy guy, man. Like, when he was a champion at the end of every fight, you know, he won for nine years straight. Um, and then after every fight, they'd be like, Anderson Silva, what's next for you? He's like, oh, I don't know. I'm retiring. I'm going to do some Taekwondo in the Olympics. Like, you just give these bullshit-ass answers <laughs> repeatedly. You know what I mean? That's, like, yeah, a characteristic Yeah, Brazilians of are kind of like that, what I think Yeah, about silly too. humor. Yeah, they like to Smart screw ass. with you, more or less. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, when I think about it, too, he's kind of already got it made. Like, he could make his living for the rest of his life. Yeah, he's rich. Like, he's fine. Like, it he's got gyms. Really matter. Yeah, exactly. He's got gyms. <laughs> he's like, yeah, I really don't need to keep doing this anymore. Dude. And yet he fought last night on three days notice. You know really? this? No. John Jones was supposed to fight Daniel Cormier for the light heavyweight title. Biggest rematch ever. Like a huge fight. He's got a main event in UFC 200. Three days out, John Jones tested positive for something. Something banned. Some performance uh... answer. UFC's revamped their drug policy, and this is like they needed to. like props to them, man. They yeah. pulled their biggest star. Three, they didn't have to. This isn't like government mandated. No, they no. chose to pull them. Well, there's a lot. Yeah, of they pressure. chose to do it, and like so, props to them. And then, Anderson Silva at 41 was like, "I'm in town. It's not my weight class. I'll go up a weight class and fight the champion." Yeah. Like Dan Cormier's the champion. It was just so great, man. Like, he got destroyed. He wasn't supposed to win. Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> he got yeah. fucked up. Damn. But, like, so, props to him, man. Oh, he showed up. 
In the third round, he hurt Daniel Cormier. It's like the best he could do. Yeah. He's not going to beat him. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's kind of tough to just suddenly shoot up a weight class and take on the best in the class. Like, yeah, it's not yeah. a realistic opportunity. Where the other guy's been training for the biggest fight of his life. <laughs> And Silva's like, oh, I was actually kind of on vacation, but you know. But I'm, I'm in town. <laughs> I could use a few few extra drink money, you know, uh, rounds here. <laughs> it's crazy though, man. It's crazy. But that's why, like, last night the fights, uh, they're still were novelty fights. Like, that yeah. one's a novelty fight. It doesn't mean anything. Brock Lesnar doesn't mean anything. He's not... He's not sticking around long. He's it, not teaching any keep, seminars. Keep the grunts, you know, kind of happy sort of a thing. But. And I'm sure they enjoyed doing it. I'm sure Lesnar was like, had a good night. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, if you're in that position to have that kind of power, to call up Dana White and be like, hey, so my schedule's a little clear. Uh, I'm getting kind of bored with this WWE bullshit. Can I just fight in, like, the co-main <laughs> event of the biggest event ever? He's like, thank you, please. Yeah. Like, that's such a cool, like... Like, I remember I talked to this dude who was upset that LCD Sound System, this band who hasn't performed in many years, has come back. He's like, dude, I was at their last show, and now they're doing more shows. I'm like, yeah, but can you blame him? Like, yeah. He has the power to, like, they headlined Coachella this year, out of retirement. Like, how many people have the opportunity well, <laughs> to just, like, oh, that'd be so cool. I mean, that's not what bands have always, like, I can't remember, like, how, it was like a joke after a while, how many like Black Sabbath reunion tours yeah. and Kiss reunion tours and Guns N' Roses reunion tours. Like, They're still going, man. <laughs> oh, really? Mm. Holy crap. I, I swear Axel should be dead by now, but yeah. yeah. It defies logic. Yeah. He's a rich guy. Yeah. He got it. He's still on going. Ooh, but he's, tour. he's got the the genetics to put up the <laughs> much damage. <laughs> it's like, wow. Yeah, that's kind of a truly amazing human specimen it's like a human cockroach on a certain level they can just survive anything <laughs> nuclear blast or radiation poisoning and stuff and can't radiation uh, axel rose man yeah. so my brother we've been talking here for 45 minutes man yeah going strong going strong so usually at this time we have a choice we can keep recording we can keep drinking i brought some weed i know you're a fan I definitely don't know. i don't know if we can smoke inside we got pause and go outside i don't know the rules well my roommate loves smoking too, even though she's a seventy-year-old woman. Really? So, oh, oh, that's a big. You know, I didn't know that. This, <laughs> this spot has so been seven probably one house. of the biggest <laughs> blessings, as far as like, I mean, it's been kind of a rough few last years in, in terms of like trying to figure out like jobs and income situations and stuff like that. I feel that, that man. Yeah, I I, I'm that. sure, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you should tell people, man, we're sitting here in this house, we're looking out the window. It's nighttime now, but when I got here, as the sun was setting, it was beautiful. So we you live sit over right a by Mission Trails Park, which is actually the biggest nature park within a city limits in the entire United States. Yeah, right down the street is San Diego, the city. Yeah. On the other, right, right in front of us is a canyon. It's well, sick. This, this is a quarry sick. down here. So, like, during the day, it's kind of noisy and stuff. I don't really mind it. But in the nighttime, it's just beautifully quiet and yeah. stuff. And we get, like, deer and coyotes coming through uh, the, the little front part that we have here. That's pretty much just, like, a little prairie almost. Yeah, I lived in Pacific Beach. So we get homeless people coming yeah. by. <laughs> <laughs> you guys got deer. We got, like... <laughs> we got, got deer the, looking for recycling. <laughs> you got other scavengers in your area. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Yeah, no, this this area rocks. I mean, it's a little bit of a bummer because I I haven't had a car for a little bit, so mm. getting around and not it's really tricky. the main vein for uh, public transit around this part of town right. either. But you know, the balance of it definitely makes up for everything. So I can go be weird. I mean, I've got like a fucking pile of weapons all the time. I can. Oh shit! Yeah, it's <laughs> <laughs> a pile of weapons. That is, yeah, yeah. You got a pile of weapons. You got your tea, you got an I Ching book. Yeah, actually, that's probably been one of the biggest. If you want to get into a little philosophy, that's been probably one of the biggest impacts as far as learning in the last few years. All right, so start at the beginning. What's up with the I Ching? So the I Ching is the oldest known literary text in Chinese history. It's supposed to be over 5,000 years old. Before the Tao Te Ching? Before the Tao Te Ching, definitely, okay. yeah. In fact, um, interesting note about the Tao Te Ching, so, you know, the, the Book of Changes or the I Ching is based on this trigram and hexagram system, you know, these three or six, uh, uh, whatever, line sets that are made up of solid or broken line, 
essentially yang and yin. Mm. And so you'll have two trigrams put together, which are three lines each, and then that makes a hexagram or a six line sequence. It's more or less like a binary sequencing, but they use this to map out kind of waxing and waning processes. So you could compare it to being like the waxing and waning of the moon, the rising of the fullness to then the waning of the, you know, to the yin cycle. And this applies to everything? More or less everything. Everything waxes or wanes. Pretty Are you saying that things aren't staying the static? same? Oh, well, you know, I don't want to pop anyone's bubble. I but. want my politics to stay the same. <laughs> I want my kids to never grow up. You know, <laughs> Are you saying things change? They, they, you know, it is the book of changes. So, <laughs> you know, it's an unfortunate truth to accept, but it helps a lot. So. But, like, I'm not going to change, right? Like, I'm 25. I know everything about the world. <laughs> I'm done learning. Well, I'm not going to change. You can have the perception of not changing. It just really sucks to deal with the consequences <laughs> of that perception. <laughs> so. No, I mean, I'll say not every copy of the I Ching is great. Mm. There's a lot that got really into alchemaic stuff or just measurement systems for the world, which is kind of more in the clever mind of humans instead of the intuitive mind, which is kind of what the more philosophical uh, Taoist uh, approach to it is, or at least the school that I have followed the most philosophy from is the complete reality Taoist, which perhaps in the better, I think, reputation for being consistent and pretty on point with a lot of their teachings and stuff. So many people listening are like, what the fuck is yeah, he talking about? Yeah, I know. What's this Taoism bullshit? Bullshit, right? <laughs> so Taoism is essentially Chinese shamanism that later, when it had to become something formal, decided to call itself Taoism. Mm. It was really just more or less a kind of a, a basic, you know, Chinese folk, uh, I don't know, culture, folk religion in a way, if you want to call it that. The customs varied from province to province, area to area. That kind China's of thing. a big place. It is. A couple yeah. thousand years ago, it's hard to get them on the same page. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, so it took obviously a lot of forms, but the thing is, is that there's certain schools, and I think it had to do with, you know, kind of the times. Usually, some of the better stuff came out of really intense, you know, uh, periods of history like the warring states period and stuff in china where it was just constant war back and forth and so having to like really evaluate suffering and you know address it and stuff they came up with some pretty awesome stuff out as of things are changing yeah ways. right yeah. <laughs> so, so <clears throat> this one i feel is really good you know like the Tao Te jing the e jing should be a mental exercise it's not a fortune teller to tell you exactly what's going to happen and how to predict it. You can use it in ways to help you come to that point of being confident in what your path is mm. or if you've asked it for help or whatever. But otherwise, it's just a really fantastic read. Just, you know, you pick maybe a couple every day to read, one in the morning, one in the evening, and then you get through it all. Sort of put it down for a while and let it sink in. Go through it again another time. And yeah, one part of the I Ching that you just alluded to is like there is a fortune telling aspect of it. Yeah. Like the part that I've seen is you get some sticks in your hands and you ask yeah. it a question and you toss them. The Yaro sticks, yeah. Yeah. And so the best explanation that I've heard about that is that it's not like the sticks know the future, but when you're doing the exercise and you look at them, you're, you can see your own projections of what you want to happen definitely so in that way it's um they just said, said it's like a rorschach test where you get an ink blot and you look at it and you think what it means and from that you can self-analyze it so can, in that way yeah. helpful i think the best way i heard it was from alan watts it's like sitting down with a wise old gentleman he doesn't tell you what to do necessarily but he'll give you kind of a general discourse of what to consider about it mm. and you kind of have to feel it out not necessarily analyze it entirely so like for instance um the lake trigram represents joy uh, also metal and then you'll have things like um you have the water trigram which represents uh, danger but it's also sort of the path to uh development and improvement we obviously go through hardships and challenges in life to grow in certain ways and stuff mm -hmm. So if you Not can me, have, man. my life's easy. Yeah, you know, some people, <laughs> some people are just born with that right karma. Dad pays my bills. It's yeah. fine. Jeez, so <laughs> must, must no pain, no suffering. <laughs> You'll get there one day. <laughs> <laughs> 
but uh, yeah, you know, like, so like if you took those two right there, so we have, you know, maybe we have the water on top of the lake. And so usually the bottom one kind of represents the internal process of what's going on. And maybe you could designate the top one as the external process of what's going on. And so uh, you can look at this as it's a sort of a developmental thing to have joy within danger or hardship mm. and stuff is sort of a quality of the enlightened mind. And right. so there might be a discourse on how one might do that on, or you know, give different examples of that, of you know, somebody who's not hung up on the particulars of life, takes you know, the struggles and hardships and stride and chooses to grow from them instead of suffering from them kind of a thing. A lot easier said than done. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> there's maybe an interesting term you, you'd probably... Uh, enjoy looking up they're really good wikipedia article on it uh post-traumatic growth mm. and this is something actually i try to promote a lot because we get stuck on issues and so we have ptsd instead of ptg mm. and this concept isn't necessarily like super new it's been talked about in a bunch of different traditions from buddhism sufi Taoism, all that all the way up to psychology and the you know modern era so to speak and so what it talks about is really just that that whole bit of, okay, yeah, this sucks and so on. I might have to suffer some injustices in life even, but that's it. You know, that's what it is. And so, you know, I can either groan about it and get stressed out about it and suffer as a result of it, or, well, it's not easy, but keep going mm -hmm. and, you know, see what you can do at that point. But I like that post-traumatic growth. Post-traumatic growth. I think that's why I like, um, I've been doing so many uh, jiu-jitsu tournaments and when I ask, or when I tell people about them, like, yo, how did I go? I'm like, oh, I got destroyed. I'm like, oh, your life sucks now. I'm like, no, like, no. I know what to work on. Yeah, like, exactly. I know, like, I know nothing about, today I got heel hooked. I don't know anything about heel hooks. Yeah. I don't know how to do them. I don't know how to defend them. It's not a surprise I got heel hooked. Yeah. But I do know what it feels like to get heel hooked yeah, now, no. which is really important, because in the gym, I don't know. I, I tap. I quit, yeah. I quit early. But, dude, I got heel hooked today. Like, on the right side of my knee, there's, like, something where it feels like a socket, like a shoulder socket, and it came out today, and I felt a sharp tingle in a very, like, the width of a pencil all the way down my leg, Oof, wow. which I don't know enough about, like, the knee structure to say what that is, but it was coming out, and so I quit, like, right then, like, luckily I got it in time, it doesn't hurt right now. Yeah. But I know what it does. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I know why they're frowned upon in a lot of competitions. It's super important to know what you're doing if you're going to be doing something potentially dangerous. Yeah, you got to know, like, worst case scenario. You need to know a little bit of the pain so that you know what you're doing to other people and mm -hmm. what you don't want to do to other people. It's important <laughs> info. And it, it's not something I can get, like, in the gym, like, all right, man, do it until it hurts. Like, I would know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, you gotta find out in competition when you're trying not to like but you know that's a good mentality in fact that i mean relates to that you know joy within danger joy mm -hmm. within crossing a, a great river is the metaphor they use for seeking the challenges in life mm -hmm. and so on so you know that's i guess an example of what you could say the e Jing can present to you now interesting the the Tao Te Ching is written in a similar like, I thought 81 passages was random, but it's um, it's a tetragram system. So, never heard of that before, but it's like a, I think it's like a four-line system or something. They use two sets of combinations of lines of either solid line, broken line, or double broken line, which I <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I know. But, okay, so, you know, the, um, the I Ching is based on, you know, the figures of eight. So Ba Gua is the eight trigram system. There's 64 hexagrams in there. So eight times eight equals 64. And altogether there's 300 and whatever it is. <laughs> total sort of lines all together, you know. Okay. They, so they go in off. It's kind of like there's a there's different ways of doing binary system and so on. And so the uh, Tao Te Ching is actually written in that context and stuff. And there's like a tetragram for each passage that goes with it too mm. so haven't read as much into that it's like a whole nother theory on doing that approach and i i just haven't been ready for it but we'll do another podcast in 10 years yeah. if you break this down 
finally start making some sense. <laughs> yeah. But, it, you know, it is actually out of the best copy of the Tao Te Ching I've come across, which was um, suggested to me by my uh, Tai Chi teacher I mentioned earlier. Um, it's called the Tao of Power. Mm. So if you ever want to check it out, it's kind of a trip. It's a little much to take in. but <laughs> I'm into it, man. I, I like Taoism. I took a Taoism class in college. But I was awesome. such a punk, and uh, my last two years of college, I didn't read any books. Like, just it was like a business major thing. Yeah. Like, I remember my sophomore year, I was in a class where I was the youngest guy in there. You can take class out of order, and I was like, I was trying to like make conversations with older kids. I was like, guys, I read the chapter, I didn't get it. Like, you have the book? And really? So something, something about like the way they looked at me. I was like, I don't get books. And so, like, it stuck with me. I was like, man, I'm not going to do this bullshit. But it was, like, a dope class. Like, his philosophy is, like, even my Zen Buddhist class, I read the books out of order. Because I really wanted to. I wanted to, like, yeah. know them. But I was like, I'm not going to do it because you told me. Well. But really, like, a thing that I look back on and regret is that mentality. Well. <laughs> but it's not too late. It's not look too at late. Me. Yeah. I can and, read books. And you I haven't know, forgotten hey, how to read. Maybe you read the things that have maintain an interest that you wouldn't have had otherwise you know it's true because you know that's the thing is there's as they say eighty four thousand paths to enlightenment in buddhism mm. and really the one for you is depending on where you're at in your life and stuff and so you know there's certain conversations and dialogues within buddhism that's not useful for everybody based mm-hmm. on where they're at it'll be useful maybe later in their life but you know buddhism so actually <laughs> I'm part of the Buddhist Education Committee at the San Diego Buddhist Temple. I'm a, in fact, I'll be finishing up my last of a three-part uh, lecture series uh, at the end of this month. You're given the lectures? Uh, given the lectures, nice. yeah. And so part of what my intent with the talk was to show, was to go over some of the different reforms and developments of Buddhism as it traveled, you know, as it emerged out of India, traveled out of India through China and into Japan and eventually end up here in America because Buddhism still continuing to develop and mm-hmm. so on. It's evolving in front of our eyes. Yeah. Which is cool. So I kind of like it. It's alive, you know. Yeah. And, you know, interestingly, we're actually kind of fortunate in America to have that phenomenon because in other parts of the world where it's tradition, it's kind of it's become the old thing, you know. Mm-hmm. It's not really exciting and new, so the enthusiasm for it's not quite there anymore. Buddhism is pretty sexy in America right now. Yeah, it is. And then I learned about it in college and I was like all up on it. I was reading, I was meditating, I was going to retreats. And then I went to Thailand where it's a, it's a Buddhist country. Oh, yeah. And I tried, I tried to ask people about it and they're like, what? Buddhism? That yeah. That bullshit those people... Like, <laughs> well, it's like coming to America and be like, man, Catholicism is dope. You're like, what? I think my grandpa likes? What yeah. the fuck? Well, in it's Thailand cool. it's very different. So... I think what most of comes over here, and not to say that the Theravadins don't come over here too. Um, it doesn't travel as well. Yeah, well, Theravada is pretty much a way of teaching Buddhism exclusively for monks. You really don't become part of the learning community or the Sangha or any of that unless you are a monk in those forms of Buddhism. Mm. So the lay people are kind of just like, well, whatever. We know we're supposed to give them alms and food or whatever. And all give up your seat. Yeah, somewhere. you know, all those things. And But you know, they don't really understand it in that way unless it hits them for some reason that they want to give up their life and go be a monk. Mm-hmm. So my, I yeah. found out works a lot like uh, joining the Night's Watch. Yeah. Like you become a monk because you rape someone and they're like, you're jail? Yeah. Or, or you like yeah. save your family's face and yeah. go be a monk. Like, okay, I'll go be a monk. That's a big part of it, too. There was that, too. Political refugees and all that, too, involved in it and yeah. stuff. So. But the Mahayana vehicle, which or school or tradition of it, which traveled through most of, you know, it went up to, well, Tibet became Vajrayana at the point where it took the Mahayana, the Theravana that had developed in India at the time. Because it, it wasn't a split. It was just like, well, we want to try and attain enlightenment through recreating the Buddhist path, which is the Theravadan way, you live like the Buddha. Mm. But then the Mahayana vehicle is to make it for everybody, essentially, that everybody has the Buddha potential within them, and they can awaken and all that kind of a thing. So it's just two two different methods on the same route, essentially. Right. Same and goal. The Mahayana vehicle particularly flourished because of China. You know, That's mm. such a huge area to be spread over and so on and then 
you know, too, you had the Mongolian, uh, you know, empires and stuff that kind of influenced spreading different religions around and so on, and eventually Korea and Japan kind of a thing. But the thing that was interesting was that it never necessarily imposed its, like, terms or its methodologies on the cultures. Right. That's why it transmitted to so many cultures, really, was that it was like, well, you know, okay, whether you believe Bodhidharma existed or not, he's still kind of a cool figure to talk about and mm -hmm. provide some context for historical works. And stuff. Bodhidharma, the guy who walked out of India, entered China, and <laughs> taught everybody. <laughs> well, like, taught Buddhism, Kung Fu, and tea. Exactly. <laughs> like, dude was a total a historical legendary badass, figure. That's right. But, yeah. like, you know, like, when he got to to uh china and stuff he's kind of like you know these are just dudes that just read all day like they're just <laughs> mental masturbating all the time and like bent back bitches kind of well <laughs> you know the term armchair buddhist or like uh nightstand buddhist where they're very well read but uh, the uh, application or the experience of it in their life is it shows. It's they can not talk cool. about it, but yeah. they get upset a lot. Yeah, but it's, it's just they have not road rage. <laughs> real for them, you know, kind of a thing. So a Buddhist with road rage. That's how they work out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> or, or any meditators like, oh, so peaceful. And then, oh, fuck that guy. I hope you get bad karma or something like yeah, that. Yeah, you know, yeah. there's that whole thing. It's like, as far as insults go, that's like a pretty easy one. Yeah. I hope your karma gets worse. Yeah. It's, like, it's pretty gentle. <laughs> You know, I guess there's an upside to that, but still, it's that you know they're not really they left the pe the practice on the pillow essentially. Yeah, yeah. And so like, you know, Bodhidharma would like notice like, man, these monks are kind of bitches. Like they're lame. <laughs> like they can't stay awake during my Dharma talks and mm -hmm. like make it through the meditations. They're like oh, falling asleep, sitting up and stuff like that. Because really, their their body was not very well conditioned and right. stuff. Like they had essentially assumed just by studying and creating good merit that they would become Buddhas. But in fact, <laughs> the Zen teachings of Bodhidharma was pretty yeah. much just like, <laughs> fuck all that shit. Um, you don't use a Buddha to find the Buddha. Right. So he was talking about like Buddhic images and like you can worship and chant sutras and study, you know, the doctrines till the end of day and you'll still never get it. You fucking suck over here. <laughs> like, it's kind of the spirit of some of the, the servants. So he was there to reform, essentially. Mm -hmm. And he knew yoga. And he thought, well, yeah, I could teach them yoga to get them, you know, kind of into the body-mind, you know, uh, thing. But, whew, China's kind of an intense place. Place. There's like two major like dynasties in this area, and they're like fighting for control. And even within a certain dynasty, there's a civil, you know, war thing for control. And just so, bandits, bandits, and like bandits. all the crime that comes with that and stuff. And of course, you know, the temples were easy targets for robbing. <laughs> so right. like, they got hit, and so Bodhidharma is like, hmm. Well, you know what? Hmm. I'm gonna teach him the the trade of military and like bandits and thieves and stuff and make them into badass spiritual warriors instead so they could hold their own grounds and stuff like that. So he reformed it. The other thing too, like China was really big on was like they love nature and mm -hmm. they love life. And Indian culture kind of is like, it can get a little detached from life for certain I think cultural perspectives and stuff where, oh, it's not about this world. It's all illusions here. Everything mm -hmm. is the illusion or the maya of Brahma and stuff. And so there's this kind of nihilistic tendency that can develop sometimes from that way of thinking. And so the Chinese didn't really like that. They're like, life vows for being a monk? They're out fucking training. Like, what if I got to go, like, work somewhere or somewhere yeah, later yeah, or whatever? Yeah. Like, I got a job. Man. Job, <laughs> yeah. It's like, I got, like, two or three years I can do with this thing. And then I need to go out and herd some oxen or something, you mm. know, make some, some money. Or whatever you got to do. Take care of your parents, maybe. Which is, you know, that was another big thing in Chinese. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. The son's piety. always taking care. Oh, well, that's, like, the ultimate duty of a child is to honor your parents the highest, mm. you know, possible way or esteem that you can and so on so you know like all right are you in the monastery because you're trying to escape the world like sometimes people just be mad at their parents or something ah oh, screw you i'm gonna go be better than you or something like that and you know that's not appropriate it's like no dude you still got karma out there that you've 
been ignoring and kind mm-hmm. of being irresponsible about. Get the fuck out there, you know. Um, there's that Andy Lau and Jackie Chan movie Shaolin. <laughs> I don't know if you. It was a pretty good one actually, but like Jackie Chan was like the Shaolin temples like cook he would make all the like steamed buns and Mm -hmm. stuff for the the all the monks and stuff like that but he wasn't like necessarily like like he knew how to fight really badass and stuff and he he does this really cool fight sequence towards the end where he's like using all his like chef tools (laughs) as expected as expected you know (laughs) but like shockingly he fights jackie chan you never think you know and he's just the chef or whatever but like i guess like when he was younger he tried to do the kung fu but then like he would get too I don't know, excited or aggressive mm-hmm. all the time, so he decided to focus on. He's cooking. too good at it. Yeah, you know, like, <laughs> you know, people always want to say like, "I was there, but I was too good." Well, no, he, I he's slam dunking on everybody. He, like, get out of the NBA. Pretty much said like he couldn't like focus and control. Like he said it just didn't really work out. He was good at it, but it wouldn't work out for him. So he just decided to be more focused and simple and practical. So cooking, steam buns, and you know he was very comfortable with his way of life there, and you know kind of took pride in being in charge a little bit and stuff. And there's a part where the head, the abbot or the head, you know, whatever, monk of the mm-hmm. temple. You know, Top dog. Just, and he's he's this character I've seen, or an actor I've seen before. He always plays the most, like, perfect, old, calm, like, kind of enlightened Tai Chi master sort of a character. He was in um, Keanu Reeves' Man of Tai Chi and then uh, Wu Ping also Tai Chi master anyway I haven't seen any of these anyway, all right. <laughs> well Man of Tai Chi is a pretty decent one if you haven't seen it already but okay. recent one anyways but just this like perfect cute grandpa sagely character you're like mm-hmm. oh I want one of those in my home you know like, <laughs> <laughs> like hey grandpa can you can you tell me something I need to hear you look like you have something I need to hear today <laughs> so, excuse me sir what is the meaning of death like, Ooh. Mm, well, let's have some tea. <laughs> but like, there's this part in like in the movie it was like halfway through where, you know, he was kind of telling Jackie Chan's character, he's like, you know, there's dharma or teaching to be done, good things to be done out in the world as well too. Mm-hmm. It's in the world outside the temple, and Jackie Chan's character was like, oh yeah, hmm. But obviously he did not look like he was up for that at all. He was yeah. kind of nervous about le- the idea of He'd grown comfortable t- in his settings. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, in China, they were very big on that. And it's like, well, if you leave the temple, it's no big deal. You obviously don't want to be here. And so we don't want to keep you here. And yeah, good luck. We need lay teachers out there and stuff. So that was a big reform. Uh, <laughs> the other one, too, was like, you know, the whole cutting off kids and, and alcohol was another one because the Taoists were like, fuck this, we love alcohol. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it was like, they had to like, Buddhism kind of had to like take back some of its Indian conservative kind of roots that it had or whatever. Right. It was like, well, I guess it, it should be about the everyday way. And so um, there's a... And the, and when I first started getting into Zen, I went on like a weekend retreat up to... A place in Idlewild. Ooh. The Yokoji. Y- oh, Yokoji. Yokoji, yeah. Center. Yeah. That's an awesome one, yeah. A great place. And I went up there for, it was like a weekend thing. Like a beginner Zazen Kai of some sort. And you meditate Session. like a couple hours a day. You, um, you know, you're up at like the crack of dawn. And then obviously I went there with my friend and we brought some joints for the nighttime. Like not, not like sticking to the, we weren't too devout. But I asked um, I asked one of the guys, you go in there and you talk to, um, I don't think he was a Roshi, but you know, he was some, some guy who's been there a while. Yeah. A guy who knows some stuff. A sensei of some And I, I asked him about sobriety and the importance of that. He's like, it's not about being sober. It's about like, if you're getting fucked up, like why? Are you running away from something or are you just enjoying it? You know what I mean? And, and I've noticed that feeling a lot. And like, there's this... Um, like spiritual tea cult that I hung out with in Taiwan a little bit. The tea, tea cult? Tea Sage Hut. You know about huh. this? Hung no. out with the dude Wuda. Oh, you'd love it, man. It's great. They just meditate and drink tea and they have like a magazine they sell. Like <laughs> it gets really cool. Like it's really good stuff. Taylor was just there on his most recent trip to Taiwan. Oh very cool. And um anyway, so he made a really good point that I think about a lot. It's like it's not that alcohol's bad, but it is bad to drink it if you don't want to. Yeah. Which yeah. I've noticed a lot. Because, yeah. like, there's something about, like, guys my age 
I think it's kind of coming down, but they want you to keep up with how much yeah. they're drinking. It's a comfort thing. They don't yeah. want to feel that they're in excess. So if you so keep I have up to with slam them, yeah. Light, like, <laughs> well, like, I don't want any part of it. It doesn't thing. make them look so bad, then you know. <laughs> yeah, it's very strange, but that, that's what I always think about. Like, it's not bad to drink. It's not bad to smoke, but there are times in your own life. And that's kind of the fucked up part, man. It's like, no one can tell me when that is. No, no. <laughs> that's it, the issue. It's true. But, I mean, okay, part like, of well, it is, you, is you will tell. <laughs> you know, like, I mean, that's the intuition thing that yeah. I think Zen tries to develop. You would be probably really interested in, this is a, in fact, I, I just messaged Daniel Boelli because I came across another. He's little, a guy who responds. He's emailed me. He's cool. <laughs> I, I really enjoy uh, just following it. I, I mean, a lot of his, like big celebrities and stuff, he just gets kind of like, eh, you know, I sort of bore out. But everything he does, I've, I've been pretty entertained by, if nothing Dude, else. I was crying in his most recent book. Oh, wow. Where he details like his wife dying and like, <gasps> That's oh, the one I wanted to, yeah, God. I wanted to read that one next. Yeah. What's it called? On Fear? Fear? Something about fear. Not yeah. afraid. Because I was kind of curious, like, man, like, I remember reading On the Warrior's Path and it was so Great sweet book. in the beginning. Like, he's like, dedicate this to my beautiful, loving wife who I would be nothing with. I mean, like, yeah. obviously love. And then I remember like coming across reading it online years later, like, his wife died after yeah. he had to get oof man that's like, tough right, the, it was like a newborn baby yeah. and then she developed something in the brain oh like wow. something like just like well you got it you're dead like something like that yeah and it's like I was literally there's a moment where this was when I was living in PB um, all my roommates were there we had like a friend over they like playing rap music and like smoking weed and playing chess and I'm on the couch trying to read that book <laughs> and just like <laughs> like choking back tears and yeah. they were like laughing and like having a good time and like what Such the a contrast. fuck? <laughs> this kid who just had a baby. Oh my god. Yeah. His wife's dying. She was so cool. Yeah. Well, the thing I, I guess I would be most curious is just like he has such an awesome mentality. He's very into Taoism for a Westerner, I find. Yeah, and, he's and very Italian, good at it. Man. Very good at it. He gets it. it. Um, and so it's just like, wow, well, what was that like for you, man? I just would love to hear like. You know, what is the growth process that comes out of that? Obviously, today you don't seem to be that, you know, held by that event or whatever. You're not stuck on that event mm. kind of a thing. You see, In fact, the beginning of his podcast is, fuck pain, fuck heartbreak, I'm still in love with life or something yeah, like that. Yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. damn, that's powerful. He's sick. And there's an episode of his podcast, The Drunken Taoist, where yeah. he breaks down like the whole uh, wife situation it's an oh, old one It'd be, okay. it's in the archives i'll have to yes yeah, but then the book the goes through it um very well but i think he's, he's a guy who embodies that um what'd you call it post-traumatic growth yeah like, coming out stronger yeah and that's why he said like he took an mma fight like he's not a young dude he's like <laughs> he doesn't even like fighting he said i remember listening but to him he's on done Joe it Rogan. <laughs> he said he actually does not like the experience of fighting all mm-hmm. the you know the challenges that come up internally and i was like that's awesome though that you would still be human enough to share that instead of this you know right. pompous kind of thing and it's like you know fighting doesn't phase me i would rather what? hear that than hearing this kind of pompous talk about yeah oh, you know i'm i can do it or whatever kind of a there's thing. a problem with that talk man because a lot of young guys they think that they're like weak because they get scared before a fight not knowing that everyone is scared before a yeah. fight <laughs> There's, like I mean, they won't sign up for tournaments. It's like you have to be a really particular kind of person to enjoy fighting. Like I, I probably am one of them. Like I got really into you know. I I remember I was like the best in karate. Like I started karate when I was five, mm. and so I pretty much became the top of the kids essentially, and so on. And like you know, most of the kids really couldn't spar me that well. Mm. And I just remembered like. Every time, like, the the instructor would call me up to spar with him one-on-one, and, like, we'd have the whole dojo kind of thing and make everybody sit on the sides and stuff. And it was cool. just, even though I knew, yeah, there's probably no way I could ever win against this guy. Not only is he, like, bigger than me, but he's, like, way more skilled. He's still to this day, like, one of the most inspiring characters in my life. Super legit as far as karate goes and stuff. And, like, I mean... I went back in like five years ago to just pay respects and hang out, train for a day with him. Dude, in his like 50s, was doing um, uh, four finger push ups with just his uh, index and his middle on each hand. 
So two fingers on each hand. Two fingers on each hand. Extended and like, doing push-ups. <laughs> and he was, he, he like demonstrated from the class and like, he's like, yeah, and I'm working on one finger on each hand. I'm just like, Jesus man, Christ. What a dude. And so, but I just remember like when I would spar him, it was so exhilarating. Like I was, I loved it. Yeah. And I remember like, the best when I got old enough to have sex and stuff, I'm like, it was kind <laughs> this of like, like karate. It was in a dis- no, it was kind of disappointing in a oh. way because like it wasn't that same enlivening experience mm. that I had already known. Kind, of, I mean, years later with the right people, partner and stuff, you know, it can be, it like can that. be like it's not that. always, not always. Not it's always. got to be the right partner, obviously. Like another certain- thing, a lot of guys don't want to admit. A lot of guys don't want to talk about unenjoyable sex. Oh, I know. <laughs> I know. I can't stand it. Like, if, I mean, if the person is just not sensitive enough to, like, meet you, then there's probably a lot of other things that are going to go wrong with that situation. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, it's a bad sign. It's a bad sign. I mean, don't get me wrong. I've had, like, fucking some of the most amazing sex from, like, the easiest personality girls and they're like there's a weird combination where those things fall in the same basket and you're like fuck really what, what? damn it okay well mm-hmm. i guess it's that crazy that's like in the fight you know the chaos aspect of mm-hmm. the fighting experience maybe but i have had it with a few really grounded and connected partners for sure but unicorns unicorns <laughs> yeah seriously <Let> them. <laughs> and the girl i've been seeing man i met her um it was my grand return to dubstep. I hadn't been to a dubstep party in four years. When was this? Took ecstasy in May in Hollywood. It was a big dubstep show in Hollywood. Oh, wow. Met this girl. It was awesome. She gave me her number on, like, the cutest way possible. It's like the, you know, girls at these shows, they wear bracelets of funny things on it. She yeah. had her number written on it. It was, like, the little blocks with her number. Huh. She came over. Um, instant sex she's like a young girl she's like 19 oh yeah black yeah. Yeah. and then like we were just talking I was like yeah tell me about yourself he's like well my dad's in jail like, ah got it that's why this is happening yeah <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's really good though you can think of relations like you know you can see the bigger picture from like that. those are not isolated things yeah it's not like well no. yeah her dad's in jail but you know she would have liked sex with you know yeah, I mean? you know, there's, there's, <laughs> yeah there's she a was of... really quick into that yeah yeah, there there is that kind of. Uh, it, it seems too good to be true, and it probably. <laughs> yeah. So it's just like my mentality about the whole thing is like every time I see her, I'm like, "Well, that was great. She's cool. Um, probably won't see her again." Yeah. And well, then it's been two days. Who knows, man? Who knows? You know, <laughs> honestly, like, and I think this is something else too that needs to be talked about more. Is there is such a thing as a healthy one night stand, or like mm. a few times and. You decide that's it. But, like, you have to really be on the right level at the right time. Like, you have to really meet each other. It can totally be healthy, you know. There's that potential involved in it. But there's the, like, comfort thing, I think, that comes up. And, like, this is actually what I dealt with with the last relationship. was, like, because there was such an uncertainty in our future directions. Mm -hmm. And when we'd talk about our futures, it didn't really seem like they were anywhere going to be lining up kind of right. a thing or crossing and yet there's that thing of well i like this so i should secure it and be comfortable i should get them in a relationship right now so it's like I'm trying to like at least point out like well you know every time we talk about that kind of direction a few years down the road kind of thing, it doesn't really seem to relate very well you want to go do your own thing which respect you should do your own thing you know don't don't let me hold you up kind of a thing I'm still figuring out what I'm trying to do right yeah. now. And if I just wanted to follow you, that might be okay. But, but like, that was the thing is, like, we were such awesome lovers, like, when we could be in the moment mm-hmm. as a couple together and stuff. But when it would come up to this thing of, like, oh, well, I want security and comfort, it's like, well, <laughs> you know, this might be an awesome, like, two-year relationship. And we can live it up to the fullest for that and you know I'm not going to make you any promises essentially because I can't you know girls love promises I know I know, <laughs> I know. They like that security well actually the sexiest girls don't I think like mm. and I haven't really interacted with one that is in my 
particular age range. Like, <laughs> I, I have, like, I will admit, some of the most awesome... Slow down, slow down, slow down. What age range are you talking about? <laughs> like, 10 years older than me, kind yeah. of thing. So, like, cougar built status or something okay. like that. And, like, honestly, it's not always that they're, like, the most perfect personalities, but there's not this bullshit around trying to get somewhere all the time with things and just really jaded (laughs) well but it's like it's so focused and anxious about getting all their needs met kind of or their desires met i don't even know if it's needs but like Mm. like one particular one that comes to mind it's just like it was awesome like totally be doing it but it's like it didn't need to go anywhere we were just there enjoying the moment for what it was totally cool there's not that awkward like oh so should i like call you next week or something or mm-hmm. you know it's just like okay well see each other when we do kind of a thing and you got other things going on you got three kids which oh, shit. really appealed to me and i you hope seem i to never be... meet them <laughs> well, oh no i have actually met all of them they're pretty cool and like i was actually really good friends with her ex-husband kind of a thing even all those things it's like yeah our relationship as a dedicated couple we can recognize that would not work out but if we don't hold that unhealthy expectation around those kind of things then wow it's an enjoyable evening (laughs) and you know we had like quite a i think like three or four in the last couple years or something like that but man you know like i think a lot of people in our age are usually they're so agitated about trying to get to whatever success yeah, looks like every 25 year old girl i know is very neurotic yeah it's like just panic it's like i don't want to work but all these guys are dicks ah god yeah <laughs> and i think there's a big thing with 25 year olds where they know that they're not getting any sexier <laughs> like that's like a big yeah. part of it like they're not like a 25 year old girl can walk into any bar i'm thinking of like a pb type scene can walk into any bar, go up to any guy, and take him it home. It only gets more as you get because thirty-five year old girl. Yeah, it's gonna be. She's got to use some strategy. Or like. Thirty is, I think, where it kind of gets to that point. Because and you can see it. Like it's funny because like I can notice like the people that I've known for a few years, and then the like weight gain that people just blame on age starts having. It's like, yeah. oh well, yeah. When all those factors of your metabolism and your physiology aren't there, then you start kind of tripping about that i'm getting goes. fat but i exercised three years ago what is this <laughs> no i used to bike all the time, <laughs> all the time. <laughs> just not anymore yeah. <laughs> yeah which i understand man i got really sick like two weeks ago and since then something about it like I was, it was completely cleaned out my system and since then i've had terrible diet so I feel for people who have terrible diets. Yeah. I get it. I've had ice cream every day since I've been sick. Yeah. Well, <laughs> giving in to temptation. You at least can, can put those things together, but a lot of people don't feel the terribleness, at least not overtly enough to like deal with. They don't go to jiu-jitsu and feel like they're going to die. Yeah. <laughs> there's that. Yeah, that Which is, is why I feel lucky that I have that in my life. Like, I, it's so many times I'm like, okay, I could be drinking this beer, but, you know, then I'll, I can't do seven rounds. I might be able to do yeah. six. You got a, a lifestyle I got fights balance. coming up. I did a tournament today. I'm doing one in six days. Next Saturday, I'm doing another one. No heel hooks in that tournament. Thank God. I think Thank I'll do goodness, a little bit better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a little but there might be chance. that other move that you just don't know is coming that's going to oh, totally yeah. take you off. Yeah. Bring it. <laughs> Show me the moves. <laughs> you know, I find like if I have the expectation, yeah, I'll probably get, you know, something knocked out of me or something like that. But oh well, well, that's probably yeah. <laughs> I usually do better for some reason. Or you know, it's just the kind of that let go mentality and stuff. I don't actually do much formal grappling arts outside of what's included in a lot of the systems and stuff. I mean the chin and stuff really is a lot of the same mentality that you're Mm -hmm. learning how joints work and how things lock up and how to control the body and stuff like that. So my Kung Fu brother, uh, Dan, I think you met him once at uh, Mad Monk. Uh, It's like the... It's possible. Anyways, dude I look up to as far as like a kind of an older Kung Fu martial arts brother or whatever, just in general. But um, 
like he's been doing jujitsu for the last few years in part because his daughters were getting into it and stuff but i mean this guy's been like a badass reason to do it fucking (laughs) i mean he's got a background at least as monstrous as mine i mean i don't actually think mine's that big or monstrous but told a lot of people i guess just the number of years sounds yeah so you haven't stopped since you're five exactly (laughs) (laughs) so you know for him he's been he, I think he did karate early on, like me too. You know, did uh, uh, wrestling all through high school, various forms of it. Did a little jujitsu, got into the kung fu and stuff like that. Served in the military, special forces for a while. Scariest man in the world. <sighs> well, <laughs> he's one of the most loving, humble kind of people, Thank and God. just awesome to be around. <laughs> so. But um, yeah, you know, so he's been he's been rolling for a couple years and stuff, and he's he's good. You know, I mean. He, Keeps up with the instructor there for the most part. You know, and he's one of those guys where even though he doesn't hold the black belt, you're like, yeah, I wouldn't. Yeah. Want to <laughs> can't but, can't put too much on the belt. On the belt, yeah. Mean too I, know. Much. <laughs> I noticed that. Yeah. So he pulls me down uh, one time when we were hanging out um, last year or two, kind of a thing, and I was like, uh, at first I was like, yeah, I don't usually I don't deal with grappling that much because I figured. I mean, I can grapple. I have no problem I'm comfortable grappling. Mm-hmm. But honestly, most fights actually end standing up. <laughs> really? <laughs> it's until somebody, I mean, in a combat situation, you know, and I haven't really had that much of an interest in sports competition. So mm-hmm. it's like, like if you learn like martial arts, pro, like McMaps, for instance, the Marine Corps martial arts program, and you know, I've talked to at least a couple former uh, recruits that went through the program and stuff. Yeah, it's not like, engaging stuff it's punch the guy in the throat move on punch the guy (laughs) in the nuts move on like you have a mission and fucking with these guys individually is not your prerogative like you need to stay as that unit and that team it's quick effective concise stuff um i think um one of the friends he was telling me like when he got his essentially like they have belts but it's just really the the same military belt but if you're in the the program you actually get colored ones based on your rank I think he said when he went up for green belt, he was actually required to take um, an anatomy class as part of it and stuff cool. and learn, you know, the way physiology works just from the general medical perspective and then apply that, you know, to your combat situations and stuff. So, you know, like a lot of, I mean, if you're in real, you know, like combative military situations and stuff, there's almost always weapons involved, mm-hmm. you know, there's hardly any bare fist fights on the field <laughs> right so you know that's the other thing too is you got to be quick you know you don't have time to go on the ground there might be another guy out there pop pop take you out mm-hmm. pretty quick kind of a thing and you know the ground fight really does not work yeah you shouldn't be like field. like my my strategy in competition is i pull guard just send like yeah. today it worked out i grab his wrist and sit terrible idea yeah. street fight. like don't <laughs> don't do that if he has like you just kick me in the face. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, like, on concrete. When you get into like jujitsu from the samurai, you know, traditions and stuff, it's a totally different art. Like, of it's maim and kill and destroy, rip things apart, and then move on because mm-hmm. there's plenty of other opponents out there yeah. to start playing with and stuff. So, but you know, like I guess in the street fight situation, just because a lot of people don't know how to target things correctly. I mean. Like, it's something that I, because I used to like getting into regular fights, too. Yeah. <laughs> like, at school and in the streets and stuff like that. But, like, I would actually watch, like, street fight videos and stuff. And it's fascinating, like, wow, is this really what most people get tripped up about? There's so much telegraphing. There's so much untrained movement. No wonder it just ends up in a, a struggle that gets on the ground and stuff. Like, you know, if I'm in a street, gonna so, fall like I'm not going to play nice. I'm going to pop your eardrum. Probably, you know, you know, there's a lot of deterrent things. Like if you smash down on the nose, you pretty much break it. And oh, just shit. the blood coming out and not Savage. being able to breathe. It's just, yeah, it's not a pretty situation. Going for the throat and just not fucking around with exchanging blows and stuff. Yeah, you don't want to break your knuckles on his face. Yeah, well, <laughs> or on his forehead. I, mean, I wouldn't think i would i mean i would use meaner <laughs> methods probably i mean like there's all kinds of things like you can use really concisely in a fight like there's increase in knockout where you have to hit from a couple angles simultaneously like you know essentially temple and neck so that you get that maximum uh 
some sort of brain rocking going on. I see. Hitting the forward in the back as well. We'll kind of, it's that, you know, leverage that you're right. pop, kind of go in there like that. And, you know, you knock people out that way. And then uh, another one too is you can hit like right above the diaphragm. There's something called the xiphoid process, which is this little tab bone that hangs off the sternum. Right. Breaking that punctures right into the lungs and all the intercostals and stuff like that. So savage. You can grab the floating <laughs> rib, squeeze. That hurts like shit. If you've, ever, I've, no, no. If you've ever had your floating rib grabbed, only by myself, and it freaked me out. Yeah, I grabbed my own. It's not like, a ah, comfortable ah. experience. <laughs> like, I mean, like the kidney kicks and stuff are, yeah, you know, they build up after a while. But I, I mean, like the thing is, is like you know. In a real fight situation, say you had guns, it's really just whoever's got the more deadlier aim at that point. Right. It's going to come out on top. And so it's like, you know, okay, I can struggle with all these things and stuff and deal with your symptoms coming at me, or I can just go right for the root and stuff. And like in Shingy, for instance, like we don't actually kick above really the waist. Everything's at the kneecap for the most Ooh. part and at the ankles crushing ankles and then like like a couple of them are meant to actually knock off the patella like, you know <laughs> oh yeah God. the kneecap essentially <laughs> for those that don't know the... my biggest fear yeah That's a, it's... it's a big controversial thing in the ufc right now oh really john jones kicks kneecaps it's oh whole... is that legit to do you can kick it, the knees it, it, it's rude it's rude yeah I see. but it's legal it's legal yeah, yeah you can yeah same way I'm sure it's legal to grab floating ribs. But like, <laughs> yeah. like well, but, I don't know if I would allow that in the league, to be honest. But I'm trying to think, like, is that something you can do on, like, a big buff man? Like, the floating sure, ribs are still available. Sure, um, Like, if he's Honestly, flexing. big guys, they, so I'm have, feeling big, it myself they right have, now, have like, big targets that they give you more easily than a rib or the torso. So, like, particularly with guys that have the big bulky arms, like, if you've had hard enough Charlie, a lot of people have had Charlie horses. Like, you just don't use those limbs after a certain mm -hmm. point. So, like, I mean, like, this comes up in Tai Chi fencing where they have essentially the or sword where they have more of that fencing sword. And so, like, one of the things that's brought up is a lot of it's really just it's cutting your wrist and your hands. Up. Like, they don't really aim for the most part, you know, to go for a lethal kill right off the bat or whatever. They might in certain situations. But Is it cutting the wrist in such a way that you bleed out? Um, no, it would disarm you. But the, oh, the just methodology so the or the sword. theory is that, like, if I'm aiming at your heart and your target is my hand, you have a way better advantage. Oh, I see. It's easier to hit the yeah, hand Yeah, it's like I'm going to have to try and come all the way here and you don't have to even reach that far compared to getting to my heart kind of a thing. That makes sense. So... <laughs> you know, like the the thing too with um, like the the Xing Yi and stuff is like they don't fuck around. They just go straight for like you know all these big muscle you know areas, and you just you fucking you do like um, scorpion knuckles or whatever, or you know really just slamming the shit out of everything. So mm. they throw that jab, okay, bam. You know you you check and then hit. Hit check, just like the same way Muay Thai is just taking out your legs constantly, yeah. just pop, pop. I'm surprised more people don't do that with the arms, like especially if you start hitting the deltoids and a lot of the bicep, triceps. There's a lot more discouragement that tends to come up when your arms are really aching in that. Mm -hmm. Like I said, that Charlie horse sense, like you see with people when the good Muay Thai fighters just taking the shit out of their legs, they're limping practically yeah it's a big head. thing with like head kicks where to block a head kick the easiest way is to raise your hand yeah <laughs> they say that's black that's blocking but like not really you can kick in the arm it's, it's, <laughs> uh, you gotta spin that's the that's the best thing you can do is just spin out of it yeah because the at that point instead of meeting the force you can at least do some of this you know that centripetal centrifugal movement to kind of knock the bulk of the force off your midline axis rolling get, with the punches yeah essentially so you know just go with it don't resist it because resisting is what hurts yeah <laughs> but you know like the thing in especially like you know we have in in the internal arts is just ripping that shit out of the tendons really like and mm. there's so much in the especially the wrists that are really delicate the arm the elbow is a pretty good one to fuck up pretty easily especially if you can get the sort of the pressure on the wrist twisting the forearm and then shooting you know things back up where you have the torquing 
pressure that's put on the elbow then. See, yeah, you're twisting your arm all contortion style. Yeah. Another yeah. one that's really, it's fucking tough to do. Like, I didn't know that this was the technique that I was practicing in, in a form for a long time. And then my teacher showed me. I was like, ah! it's like the first kind of flinching that I had had in a while with training. But there's this thing where it, it just looks like you're, I don't know, doing like a rolling choo-choo train motion with mm-hmm. your arms. And then you'll, you know, kind of plant the, the two arms forward. And then you take a shuffle step and you kind of turn over and, and make a fist. And it's like, all right, like punch or something like that. And my teacher showed me the hands go into the armpit cavities, grab the axillary, squeeze, rip, and twist, and shoves them up. So, like, that's that, the muscle? Yeah. So, you have like the, so the like, under pec? Hey, yeah, I'm not going to do it hard <laughs> to you. But, you know, there's a lot of stuff in yeah, there. It hurt that, instantly. It's that muscle, like, it's the pec between, minor, yeah. technically the edge of the pec major that you can <laughs> oh. see right by the armpit there. I yeah, mean. when he did that, I was like, oh, I get it now. I don't oh, need that. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> um, I remember, like, you know, like another thing that you can always do, too, is is really just start taking out, um, like, a lot of the points along the neck and stuff, too. Um, like there's a lot of soft areas there. Mm. I don't know if that's legal in sports fighting, because I know... The next sort of a tricky one to yeah. strike or if you're trying to stay nice or legal about it. But. Yeah, I was trying to think, man. Like, th- so there's so many of these like old school martial arts ways just to destroy humans. Yeah. Like at <laughs> some point in a perfect society, that's gonna be in the UFC, right? Someone's gonna be taking out eyeballs and like ripping. Might off have tendons. like cyborg surrogate robots to fight with then or something <laughs> <laughs> where you can do that. <laughs> but like, I don't see why not. Like. But obviously there are reasons. Yeah. There are reasons beyond my comprehension. But it seems like at some point that guy is going to enter. The guy who can just rip off tendons. And we'll see. Like, can you do that without taking a punch? Or you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Can you do it without leaving yourself open? Yeah. I, I'm assuming that's the reason why everyone's not doing it. Well. Or they haven't quite put yeah. it all together. In the same way that karate wasn't in the UFC for 18 years. Yeah. It just wasn't a thing. Because well, it's the trends. they have to know how to wrestle as well. Yeah. If you go in there just doing karate, like hands down, like <laughs> Yeah, you know if you're I mean? only a single stylist, you're probably not gonna do it. I mean, there not are anymore. certain karate systems that are still based in like the war arts that they originate out of, and they will go over a number of different things. Like the Tong Sudo Association that I trained with, they did you know, they did different scenarios and stuff, especially once you got to black belt. They you know, there would be specific black belt classes that they would do like once a month where it was just all black belts and so your training was <laughs> on a different level than showing mm. up to regular class and they'd have like summer retreats and stuff so black belt camp or whatever you want to cool. call it and it's just like a whole weekend of being out of the city and stuff and just fucking training you know and doing things that are a little bit outside of what's easy to teach in the, the studio kind of a deal and yeah I mean like that was actually the first time I got exposed to Tai Chi. There was an instructor from Arizona that did both. Because after a certain level, like fifth or sixth degree, you were actually encouraged or required uh, to learn another uh, art, mm. or some sort of a martial art it's in good addition. Rule. Yeah, to give you context and perspective and stuff like that. And so, so that was this other guy's uh, art and so on. And so like we did like a Tai Chi version of like a karate form essentially, and we did some push hands sensitivity stuff there but yeah sometimes we do the the grappling and so on but very few especially the taekwondo the sports sparring oriented kind mm-hmm. of karates it's yeah. yeah it gets weird when something turns into a sport yeah it that really don't quite make sense <laughs> yeah. yeah i mean it's something i have to like constantly question about like what i'm training it's like well should i really learn how to fuck people up and kill them at all like i mean like weapon yeah, arts like yeah, what yeah. am i really gonna do am i gonna slice people or could, well i do get to imagine that as i pass people while working at good old sprouts like, <laughs> oh, what's the sensation oh that God. i would what's the right axis and like dimensions i need to approach to have that right angle to pull the blade across this is like all the white people at sprouts is their biggest fear and well, that no, dude just like fantasizing like, about killing me well they're seeing like <laughs> i mean because i don't know i kind of work <laughs> using my kung fu all the time pretty much it's 
you know, if you've ever seen the 36 Chambers of Shaolin, that kind of mm -hmm. idea of just using your chores as your training as well. Oh, I like, see. Always practicing, more or less. And so they're like, wow, you're like a dancer or a ballerina or something. You spin and move so It's like, you have no idea. <laughs> kill you right yeah. now. <laughs> it's like, Jesus. oh. If the friendly customers at Sprouts only had any clue what was going through my mind. Jesus something. Christ, man. <laughs> you frightened me. But, you know, at the same time, though, it, you know, like what we said earlier, it does definitely, like, you don't need conflict after that. Yeah. I mean, it's fun to have a match, for sure, but yeah. it's different then. But. Yeah, and I have that dilemma of, like, the reason for training. And I can't really, like, defend it to anybody, but, like, there's it, my, my style of jiu-jitsu in particular is very easy to talk shit on. Yeah. Like I said, like, I pull guard. That's not a good move in, like, most real fighting. It's yeah. It's a sport move. Yeah. But the only, like, explanation I can come up with, like, why I stick with it is because it's fun. Like, it's, it's a room I go into with nice people. <laughs> I you get know, exercise. I'm stronger than I've ever been. Honestly. It's fucking cool. That's it, dude. <laughs> like, like, I mean... And I don't think there needs to be a better reason for, like, like anything. like, timeless moral story for martial arts, whatever, movies and stuff like that, is that, you know, it's not about being the best. It's really about having a community and camaraderie to... And having you know, fun, yeah, enjoying it. Growing together with people and stuff, but... Like, that's the thing that I do like about Tai Chi, even though currently I've become the old hermit on the hill here as far as uh, interacting with people and stuff. Mm -hmm. I realize, man, you got to make money to be able to train. Yeah. <laughs> it costs, you know, quite a bit to get good training and stuff. But, but yeah, I mean, Tai Chi is, like, that's the wonderful thing. Like, I mean, even though I got my ass handed to me by Miss Anne, like, God, that's an amazing experience to have and just to be able to interact with people. And then... She's willing to help me out, figure that out with, you know, within my own process kind of a thing. And so it's like, wow. And I remember, like, so I went to, like, a holistic health school, and, like, a big part of our program and our training for holistic health practitioners was, like, life coaching and counseling, emotional release facilitation and stuff like that. So, like, one of the people that was in my class was actually one of my teachers from school. And so it was, like, kind of this, oh, well, now we're fellow students or mm. something along. But I just remember, like, one day he was just like, wow, guys, I just I really want to say, like, thank you so much for, like, this whole experience of getting together and stuff. Like, honestly, for a long time, and I've been trying to deal with it in my, like, counseling sessions and stuff. Like, I just feel really uncomfortable when people put their hands on me. Like, mm -hmm. it's weird. I'm a massage therapist and all these things. Like, I, I feel like I shouldn't be, but I just, I get so uncomfortable and, like, you know, it's it's just it's so helpful to have that experience that you know I don't have to flinch, I don't have to be fearful, even with somebody pushing on my chest and like you know kind of sort of ramming a you know some force down into me. I know I can I can take it. I can be soft. I can still be centered and relaxed. And it was like a big breakthrough for him emotionally. It looked like, like he yeah, was just glowing. <laughs> I've, I've heard that's the most practical part of jujitsu in terms of like a self defense. It's just getting comfortable with someone in your personal bubble. Yeah. Like, every class you're, like, essentially hugging a stranger <laughs> yeah. for, like, like, up to seven strangers. <laughs> yeah, I didn't think like about really it like that. Like, really close <laughs> contact. And so, like, if someone's in your face, like, in a bar, that's when a lot of people panic. You know? Yeah. I and mean, that's, like, um, there's an instant, like, moment where you're just like, fuck this! And, like, that's when you, you throw just punches go, you shouldn't yeah. have. And, yeah. like, stuff like that. Whereas now, like, in a quarter, like, if someone comes up to my chest, I'm like, what the fuck? This is weird. Yes. Yeah. As opposed to like, get the fuck out of here, bro. Like, yeah, I don't, you like, don't have, have to that, put like, on that other kind of fight with it. Yeah. yeah. It's like, yeah, you're close. I don't, it's not, not a thing. I have proc, I have situational awareness here. I'm okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But man, an hour ago I hinted at that we should stop recording. Well, and it's, it's flown by, man. Yeah. I've dropped a lot of words. I don't know what they mean. Well. I assume my listeners don't know either. I assume they're confused. I assume they're not listening. But if you are... Send me a message. Send me a message. I'll send you a story. It's something I try to do at the end of every podcast. If someone makes it to the end and they send me a message, I'll send them a story they've never read because I have a lot of stories no one's read. I spent many months you. typing out stories. I worked hard. I sat in the library and never did anything with them. That's awesome. So they're good. You're a like, piece of yourself in that way, yeah. Yeah, but I guess as they're, they're meant to be put online of some sort and just never did it. So at some point, it'll I happen. So if you're listening, you want a story, got you. 
<laughs> if you've already gotten a story, I'll send you a new one. Keep them rolling. Akira, I appreciate the knowledge, man. You draw some philosophy. You made me some great tea. You're a legendary host. I say we turn off this recorder and smoke some weed, man. How's that sound? Sounds good to me, brother. Thanks awesome. for the session. Um, I don't know if we can end on a positive note. Um, don't be afraid of death. Exactly. Keep living. <laughs>